what kind of students major in human bio? And what I know about this is from my research of the class of 1981. We learned a lot of things, and one of the, so in order to make sense out of this immense body of information that we generated, we classified students into four groups based on whether their educational choices were primarily in response to career aspirations or career preparation or in response to intellectual interests. Typically, there are two, three types of students who major in human bio. First of all, and this we all know, are students who have interests that were very specific, but they don't fit uh, within the confines of a particular department. So they don't want to major in biology or psychology. And human bio makes it possible for them to kind of customize their education. Second are pre-meds who want to go to medical school, have to fulfill the pre-medical requirements, but don't want to major in biology, which is sort of one of the common ways. And so they major in human biology, which accomplishes the same purpose. And I think this is, uh, there is data to show that the chances of getting admitted into medical school if you are a human bio major is no less or more, <coughs> at least not less than being a biology major. Now then there is a substantial group who come to human bio because they don't know what they want to do. But they don't want to sort of rush into a, a, an educational path simply because that's what everybody else is doing. Or because you really need to be in a defined, you have to declare an interest in this or that. So if you are a student who either is unclear about what he or she wants, or he or she wants so many things that there has to be a certain weeding process, then human bio provides a very nice home for them. Because if you don't know what you want to do, and you are a biology major or a psychology major, you will stick out like a sore thumb, because everybody else knows what they want to do. With, the, with human bio, there are a lot of people like you. Now, there is another element here, which is also very important. Parents. Parents are very concerned about what their kids are going to do. They, most parents send their children to Stanford and pay this enormous sums of money so that they end up with a good job, a good career beyond a job. So if a student tells his, her parents, I'm majoring in biology or psychology or something else, the parents at least know what that is. They may be happy or unhappy about the fact that their child is majoring in philosophy, but they at least know what it is. If they say, I'm majoring in human biology, the parents have no idea, because this is not a field like these other fields. So I think there's a lot of nervousness, particularly if parents sense that their kids are kind of a little bit unclear about where they are going to go. So now they are going into a department that declaring a major which itself seems to be unclear of what is this all about. But that's, is, that is where you know, they need to learn that this is, not only a, this is not a waste of time, but a very useful period. By the time they graduated from Stanford, and having had this opportunity in human bio for a couple of years to find their bearings, they all did. Very few of them, 10 years later, were still at sea about what they wanted to do. This, this is clearly spelled out, and I think this is a very important function that uh, human bio, specifically in Stanford generally, allows people time to make sure that they are following a path which is exactly what they want to do. The opposite, I, and I have seen quite a few of these, who jump into a preordained path and then that leads to going to law school or some other school. And 10 years later, they are unhappy. They're not, they don't like what they're doing. They're making a lot of money and they're successful, but that's not what they wanted to do. I came to Stanford in 1966 uh, as an assistant professor of psychiatry. And the person who brought me here was David Hamburg, who a year or two later was the one of the founders of human bio and my recollection is that 
I was involved with human bio at the time, but in a in a rather uh, minor way, uh, as you know, one of David Hamburg's younger faculty members. But um, I started the human sexuality class through a committee that was looking at uh, university health was the rubric. And it was mainly focused on student health. And uh, David Hamburg had been on that committee. And then he left and asked that I replace him. So in the conversations of that committee, there were two, two, two people from the medical school. There was a senior person who was a professor of medicine, and there was, there was me. Uh, the conversation turned to concerns about uh, what we used to call venereal disease and uh, pregnancy. And so I said, mainly simply to participate in the discussion, if you are so concerned about these issues, why doesn't somebody teach a course in, in sexuality? Well, uh, they said, oh, that's a great idea. Uh, why don't you do it? And my reaction was, well, <laughs> for one reason that I cannot do it is that I don't know anything about the subject matter, which was really true. I mean, yes, I went to medical school, so I knew uh, the anatomical differences between male and female and reproduction and so on, but nothing virtually about uh, sexual behavior, even during my residency training as a psychiatrist, except for what Freud had to say about sex. There was really not much I knew, was taught. Well, so when I objected saying, no, no, I can't do this, and uh, Bob Sears, who was dean of the uh, School of Humanities and Sciences at the time, and was chairing this committee, said, Oh, if ignorance is what's stopping you from teaching, don't worry about it. Uh, I have been at Stanford for 30 years, and ignorance has never stopped anybody teaching anything. So it became something of a joke. Anyway, so I started teaching the course, and I thought, I think I offered it first in 68 uh, uh, under a program that was called Undergraduate Specials. It was one of those sort of cluster of courses out there outside of departmental structure. And the first year, uh, 68 students showed up. The second year, 420 students showed up. And then it became a huge class. 1,000 students showed up. And we moved to uh, Mem Odd. I think when it became this large class, it may have been even with the um, 400 uh, size, Norm Kretschmer, who was then the director of human biology, approached me and he said, well, you are already teaching in human biology. Uh, wh why don't we make this class a human bio class? I said, well, that would be great. And so that became now human sexuality 10, human bio 10, human sexuality. And of course, stayed in human bio all these years. Now, one of the questions uh, that comes up and I noticed this came up in some of your other interviews, is were there courses, were there things that human bio did that wouldn't have been done uh, in departments? And the answer is yes, and I have um, several examples. Virtually every course I taught in human bio other than the core uh, were things that I, I put together, and these courses uh, you know, went on as long as I was teaching, and then they died with me. Some courses must not be simply kind of intellectual exercises, which of course what this is what the university is about, but they should also address the personal concerns of students. Now, personal concern is not the same thing as a problem, although it can be problems. So with human sexuality, again, I mean it's it's clear that I did not I did not start this course because I was aware of a big need out there. That I wanted to teach it for my own purposes, but then it suddenly turned out very responsive to need or wide interest. And then over the years, over 20,000 students took that class. And I mean, also the fact that, remember this, my proposal to teach this class, or their suggestion that I teach this class, came in 1968. Would it have happened in 1958? Or 85? I mean, that's a very good question. You know, I may, I may be a good swimmer, but I can't walk on water. 
So it's not like I would have developed a course come hell or high water. It was at the right time. T students were, were, were clamoring for something like this. And when they have a class and this guy who doesn't look like a hippie stands up and talks about these things and their parents are not upset and the, the university is not embarrassed, then it works. I mean, frankly, when I just spoke to you now, I, this is the first time I realized that the fact that this course was taught in 68, that was made it possible, had nothing to do with me. It was the culture of the time. I have just finished writing my autobiography. This is not public knowledge, and I'm not sure I'll publish it. But the point is that I, I dwell on this, my human bio-involvement, in that it was a very important for me personally, because David Hamburg left the Department of Psychiatry, went to bigger things. And he was my link to the department. Uh, Department of Psychiatry is very biologically oriented. I think, I, I think it's very important, the work they do, but I'm not interested in that. And I, I became, um, I, wouldn't, I, mean, I sort of was not feeling at home anymore. And the psychiatry I had learned was not applic applicable here. So I was kind of stuck. And the fact that this, this foot in the door in human biology, human sexuality, uh, which eventually led to my becoming a university administrator and then going back and teaching in human bio for another 20 years. So it was wonderful. And I just, my career would simply have not been the same. And I shudder to think what else it would have been if it were not, had not been my involvement in human bio. Oh, I, you know, that during the 60s, 70s, because I was teaching the largest class, one out of four undergraduates was in my class. The, the student radicals did everything they humanly could disrupt my class. Because I was stupid enough to teach, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So you disrupt the, you know, morning class, nine o'clock, eight o'clock, Monday morning. That means that, as they said, business would not be as usual. So I had many confrontations. I don't know how embarrassing they were. They were really aggravating because, you know, I mean, they cut into my class time. They never shut down my class, but they sure as hell compromised uh, the amount of time. And you could be more specific. Well, okay, I'll, I'll be specific. There was something called guerrilla theater. And guerrilla theater consisted of three, four guys or women come together dressed in these kind of Renaissance type costumes. And they would put on a skit, which was an anti-war skit. Well, I knew that they were going to come to my class. It was just a matter of time. And I was teaching in Memorial Auditorium. And so I was just dreading that. Um, well, we had already had those who were lying down on the steps. Students had to step around them. And we, but this was big time disruption. So one day I'm giving a lecture. I hear this flute. They had a flute player who provided the music. The flute and Memorial Auditorium, you know, in the back is a huge space. You can drive a car across it. I had somebody drive a motorcycle. But there were a lot of pranks, you know. But this time, so I continued to talk, pretending like I was not hearing anything. But I could, I could hear and see from the corner of my eye, they were advancing on stage. And I could see on the face of the students. So they came and standing right behind me. I'm talking as if, you know, they're not there. So the ringleader or the head of this theater kind of touched me on the elbow. So I said, yes. Uh, he said, uh, we are the guerrilla theater and we would like to put on our skit. I said, but I'm not giving a lecture. And he came even closer to me and he said, well, you have a, you have a choice. You either give us 10 minutes to put this on or you argue with me for 20 minutes. Oh, it was like, well, Golovin is, <laughs> is on the ground. Because you had a rapier. <laughs> <laughs> and you could cut the air with a knife, you know. These, these, I don't know, a thousand students are just pairs of eyes. Are, what, what is this guy going to do? So I came even closer to him and I said, look, I don't know how it's going to be after the revolution, but right now I am in charge. 
However, I said, these are the these are the paying customers. They are in this class. They're paying tuition. Why don't you put this to a vote? Do they want to hear the guerrilla theater, or do they want to continue with my lecture? I'm, I'm counting that they would vote for me. Well, I mean, what could they say? I okay, we are agreed. Yes, we are agreed. So I turned to the class. I said, we are going to put a vote, and this is the way the questions are going to be phrased. So you want to know ahead of time. So. All those who want to uh, see the guerrilla theater, there were a few very loud voices. Those who want me to continue the lecture, big oh yes, okay. So I said, sorry, you know, your classmates would prefer to go to the lecture. So they turned around and got off the stage, but they didn't leave. Lecture finished. And, but you know, this is a big distraction. Not only 10, 15 minutes, but you know, I'm, what was I talking about? I don't know where to pick up the thread. So I finished lecture and putting my you know, stuff together. The same guy who got into this conversation with came back and he looked very hurt. And he said, did you have to humiliate me like this in front of the class? <laughs> I said, I can't believe you're telling this to me. You come into my class, you interrupt me, and you are, you know, giving me an ultimatum, basically, or making an ass out of myself, trying to, and you are complaining that I humiliate you. <laughs> I mean, come on. I also said to him, I said, look, I wouldn't say to the class, but I am on your side. I am against the war. So, you know, it's not that, I don't basically agree with your aims. I said, but you're interrupt interrupting my class is not going to stop the war. And if they had said guerrilla theater, I would have shut up. I said, 10 minutes, fine. You know, I'll watch it too. <laughs> that's a great story. So that's a, yeah, that's an interesting story. <laughs>